Welcome everyone to this fireside chat with Ilkka Paanenen on how to build a thriving startup culture. My name is Johannes, I am the head of partnerships here at Slush and your Slush friend for this session. We have Ilkka, the CEO and co-founder of Supercell uh, and our own moderator Nelly, director at Be Healthy. Thanks for being here and welcome. They will soon tell you more about themselves but first, I'll run you through the agenda for the session. We have some exciting 45 minutes ahead of us. The far side will last about 20 minutes, and Il Canelli will be taking questions after in the Q&A session. Make sure to use the Q&A feature right there on the bottom of the Zoom call to ask your questions. This way, they can be easily picked up by Nelly for the Q&A. Without further ado, have a great session, and I hope you'll learn a lot. Stage is yours, Nelly. Wow, hello everyone, and thanks Johannes for the introduction. Oh, wow, so good to be here. On my behalf, I'd like to warmly welcome you all to this discussion with Ilka Pananen, the CEO and co-founder of Supercell, on, on one of the most crucial topics for startups, in my personal opinion, how to build a thriving startup culture. My name is Nelly Sager, uh, and it's my honor to have this conversation with Ilk. I'm an engineer by background and, and have co-founded two health tech startups, the latter of which called Fifth Corner Inc. was acquired last fall by Hintza Performance. But so Ilka, how are you? Good to see you. You too, Nelly. Uh, I'm, I'm good, uh, working today from the home office. How are you? Home office day, <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> Surprise, surprise. <laughs> oh, yeah, exactly. Wow. But yeah, so thanks for asking. I'm good as well. Also working from the home office uh, today. But now I, I suggest we deep dive into today's topic, building a thriving startup culture. And at this point, I would love to highlight uh, the wonderful blog post called 10 learnings from 10 years that Ilka wrote on May this year on the 10th anniversary of Supercell. So I suggest you go ahead and Google it because it's wonderful. So because the blog post is about building the Supercell company culture. And as you can imagine, this conversation is very much inspired by those learnings. There are so many angles we could take to this topic. Uh, but the first theme I would love to discuss with Ilka is trust. I know trust is a big word and can mean many things on many levels, but what does trust mean to Supercell as a building block of your company culture? So Ilka, please go ahead. Well, um, before actually getting to your question, like let me give you some context and, and uh, uh, maybe to explain a bit like how I think uh, uh, our culture is unique and, and what, what makes us sort of different. Mm -hmm. So, um, so in, in my view, like, uh, you know, the way people have traditionally built companies is that you have uh, this kind of traditional structure where uh, it's the management team uh, that creates the vision for the company. And then there are these others like uh, under the management team to execute against that vision. And then uh, to make sure that the company um, actually does make, make progress towards this vision, the, the management team has created all kinds of like control mechanisms, um, such as say management layers and processes and, and, and that type of mechanisms. And, um, and, and how Supercell is, is different is that we wanted to uh, turn this traditional structure upside down. Uh, so at Supercell, it actually is the individual uh, teams, the game teams, first and foremost, who own, they completely own the vision of their product, the game. And they also have a complete control on how they execute against their, their vision. Wow. And, 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 you know, uh, we as a company have, we have very few processes and, and, and management layers. And, and instead, I guess you could say that we've replaced these traditional control mechanisms with this very simple thing called trust. And, and you know, like uh, I, I believe that the kind of the best way to build a company 
is first of all, you need to hire people who are better than you are. Then you build great teams out of these people and, and, and create the best possible environment where we, these teams can thrive and have the biggest possible impact. But then, you know, you basically sort of let go and you just trust these teams and these people completely. Uh, and, and, you know, like if I think about the way I think about trust is that, you know, in the absence of these control mechanisms, which we have very little of, you know, trust actually is the most important thing that, you know, actually keeps our company together. Yeah. So, so say, you would say even like trust creates ownership. Uh, you know, it, it does. And it, it, I mean, I think trust is, is sort of the foundation for everything that we do, because that's about ultimately that's sort of all we've got. Hmm. Exactly. Exactly. So, <laughs> wow, that is uh, so true. But um, the next question I have for you is that actually about the learning number eight from your blog post. Um, resist the temptation to create processes and rules, even when you have made a mistake. <laughs> but um, I have to say, I'm curious about the no processes part because um, uh, or can you please elaborate a bit more on the su on supercell's relationship with processes? Because as a as an industrial engineer, I have learned <laughs> many times that processes can be both friends and foes for sure. So, what's what's your take on this? Can, are 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 all processes you know enemies of ours <laughs> and enemy, enemies of trust, the trust and ownership? <laughs> uh, you know, I, I don't think it, it's it's that black and black and white. Um, you know, if, I mean, let's let's think about sort of the pros and, and cons of, of having processes. So and let's start from the, the pros, the, the benefits. So obviously, like if you have a, a process, then uh, like one might say that you don't really have to think what to do, you know, just follow the process. And this potentially saves time uh, in, in that decision making moment. Um, also, like if, you, if, if there's a process, uh, that sort of guards something, it ensures that the company always does things in a very consistent way. And, and you know, there are tasks and, and functions where this actually does make a lot of sense. Like take accounting, for example. I mean, it, it does not make sense to reinvent accounting every single time you do it um, for oh, obvious yeah. reasons. <laughs> But, but then like if, if you talk about the other side of the process and processes and, and sort of cons or the potential negatives, uh, well, you know, we, I, I just say that, you know, you don't have to think what to do, you know, just follow the process, uh, which is sort of a benefit in certain um, tasks. But the, but the same benefit can turn into a disadvantage in, 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 in a different type of tasks. And particularly if those tasks uh, require creativity uh, and you know think, thinking something from from scratch uh, so you know uh, if people do not think uh, what is the best thing to do in each every situation and they just blindly follow a process it, it can actually be a really big problem in in in, in many different tasks and, and and in tasks that are creative uh, by by nature um, uh, and, and you know the, the risk is that you know if, if people if people they blindly follow the process, as I say, they don't think themselves. And, and because they don't think themselves, uh, they don't think about the unique aspects of the situation or, or the decision at, at hand. And, and, uh, and I think the other problem with processes potentially is that, uh, you know, perhaps the process was put together like many years ago. And at that time, that process probably was very relevant and it's it sort of like it, it made sense. But, you know, uh, since the process was, was originally put together, it's quite likely that things have changed over time uh, and it doesn't apply anymore. It doesn't make, make sense anymore. And, 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 but yet people just, you know, blindly follow the process and, and you know, uh, don't do what's, what's, what, what, would, what would be the best thing to do at the at, at, at moment. And, and maybe thirdly, the thing I would sort of point out is that I think the real danger in processes is that you will end up doing things as they've kind of always been done. And, and interestingly, and you know, we've noticed this ourselves at Supercell, you know, I mean, the more successful the company has been, you know, the bigger this danger actually is. And, and you know, um, one of the best things I've heard someone say 
uh, what is that you know sort of like what made you successful successful in the past you know that same thing doesn't necessarily make you successful in the future or actually quite likely it won't make you successful in the future because something is going to change uh, it's not a, a question of if it's a question of when exactly exactly and it, it also requires quite a bit from your from your employees or team members that they are in this constantly moving <laughs> no processes and full of uh, loads of trust uh, uh, you know, uh, including uh, environment. So it must be super exciting and also frightening for them <laughs> at some time. Yeah, you know, I, I feel that, you know, trust is something that it's, it's sort of easy thing to, to say and it's a fun thing to talk about in, in conferences like this. Uh, <laughs> but, but, you know, it, it's much harder uh, to kind of put in practice and, 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 and you know, it's, especially when, when things aren't going the way you would like them to go. And, mm -hmm. and especially... If you also disagree with what the team, you know, is, is about to do or, or, or wants to do. And that sort of is the real test, I, I feel, of, of, of sort of trust. And, you know, we, we, we as a company, we've been several times in these uh, uh, sort of, a, I would call them like almost like pivotal moments of a company where, you know, uh, we've uh, had a situation where, a, say, a game team wants to do something and then almost everybody else around that game team actually disagrees with what the game team is about to do and then mm. you are at, at this sort of crossroads mm. so either you take the path that okay uh you know most of the people actually disagree with the team uh so therefore it's it's quite likely that if, if we let the team to do what they want to do that is quite likely the kind of wrong business decision uh at, at least in the short term uh but on the other hand if, if we don't let the team do what they want to do and we don't trust them to do the, the best thing, you know, even if it might be the kind of a good for the business in the short term, but, but it will like completely destroy the long term because it destroys the culture. And, mm. and, in, and what I'm maybe like one of the most, the things, thing that I'm probably most proud of at Supercell, or one of those things is that, you know, in every single case, like this and we've had many during our history we've always taken the approach that we trust the team and and and, and you know uh, and and in many cases that has been actually funnily enough also the right business call but even if it wasn't the right business call i still believe that it would have been the right call because that keep uh, enables us to kind of sustain our culture well that's 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 a massive massive point and um Let's maybe build a little bit more on, on, on that one. Or uh, I want to hear a little bit more about value. So how do you see the relationship between values and company culture? And what have you learned about crystallizing company values? And what has actually been Supercell's way of uh, doing that? Well, um Actually, like, uh, like, and here's a, like, uh, if you haven't read this book, here's a, like, I want to recommend a, a really great book. Uh, actually, the best book that I've written about cultures. Um, it's uh, uh, written by by Ben Horovitz, and it's, I think the title was like, uh, "What uh, you do is who you are." And and really, you know, the title says it all. I mean, culture it's not defined by words, and you know, writings on the wall or or any kind of culture decks or presentations or talks. You know, culture is defined by everyday actions and the work that people actually do. And, and you know, we've learned that more than anything, culture uh, is defined uh, by sort of the hardest decisions that the company makes. I mean, it's those like really tough moments uh, and, and those hard decisions that, that really, you know, defines what, what, what the culture is. So you can't have a culture value and values where you're going to say one thing, but then when those values are really tested, you, you kind of take the other route. And, 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 you know, some people have even say that if, if it doesn't like hurt sometimes to follow your values, then the, those aren't real values, actually. And, like and the, you know, like you mentioned earlier that you prioritize the long term sort of view and benefit over the short term, uh, maybe gain by, uh, you know, letting the, the team decide what to do. Yeah, well, that would be like one example of that. The other example would be that, you know, you know, our 
dream uh, is to create these games that as many people as possible would play for years, you know, if not for decades and games that would be remembered forever. So a very bold dream. And, and you know, for us, and, and, and for us, like, uh, you know, that is like what, what quality ultimately means. Uh, which is, of course, an important value for, for any company and, and, and also for us. But, you know, the, the kind of practical implication of what I just said is that we, we kill a lot of games. And, 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 and trust me, it really, it really hurts to kill these games. And, and I always feel, you know, really sad for, for, the, for, the, for the game team who has to make those type of decisions. Uh, and, and, and by the way, you know, they make those decisions, they kill their own darlings. Not because uh, I, for example, would say tell them to to do that. I, I never do that. It it always comes from their own initiative. But but you know the reason they do that is is that you know that we only release games that we we feel that have a shot that fully fulfilling that that dream. And it's exactly those type of really hard, even sad decisions that I I, I believe like uh, define the culture. Wow. Well, wow. That's that's. Massive. Could you please maybe give a little bit more uh, light on on how you create the values of of Supercell, like like concretely, like some value building <laughs> or creating advice to our to our audience. Well, you know, I I don't think you can like uh, sort of uh, create sort of create the values like obviously like uh, in a vacuum. So I, I think, as I said, you know, you know, I think you have to look at your team and and actually ask them. You know what I mean how do they want to work together uh, with each other and what are the things that they do fundamentally believe in and, and what what are the values that they believe in and, and then you kind of uh, somehow you, you you need to find a way to kind of formalize those and and I would uh, hi- highly recommend everybody to like put those in, in in written and then you actually start to hire against that culture and those values and and you also fire against that culture and values and then every once in a while you should revisit uh, the, the culture and the values and see if, if people still believe those are the right values and, and you know like the, the one thing that I, I'm, a, I'm a big believer in is that I don't think culture and values are something that is like completely set in stone so I, it's not that you know I, I don't think that you should change them every day of course but I also don't believe that the other extreme is true that they, will, they should always stay as, as, as they are, because it's, it's just completely natural that as your company changes, it grows, it learns more. And as you learn more about like the, the things that you want to do and you learn more about your team and the environment, I mean, of course, uh, as you, in a similar fashion that you, that you always want to improve, I, I think you also want to improve the culture. And as you learn more, you know, the, also the culture can and should get better. So therefore, I, I, I do think it's important to you know, every once in a while, in our case, it's maybe uh, once per year, once per two years, we actually like invest quite a bit of time to review uh, the values and culture of the company. And the one benefit that we have, have as a company, but we're still relatively small. So we are a bit more than 300 people. I, I believe that we have roughly around 40 teams at Supercell in our four offices. And, and you know, it, it, and what we do is, is that I, I together, um, with our kind of small leadership team, we actually meet with every single team at Supercell. We have like literally like four deep meetings, and 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 we in advance of those meetings, we ask the teams to think about like and, and you know about the values that we have. We're gonna send the the most recent culture document that we have, and we ask them to suggest changes. So something that should be added, something that should be removed, something that should be changed, and then we have a discussion about it. Uh, and, and, you know, we, we go through every single team at the company and then we sort of consolidate the, the kind of uh, input that, that, that we've gotten from these teams. And that, that always becomes the kind of next version of the, of the kind of a culture deck or, or memo uh, that, that we have. Wow. So, dear listeners, take note. <laughs> this is how important the, the values are. Yeah. Maybe, maybe just one, one more thing to, to add in there, like some, something, a, a sort of a mistake that... Uh, uh, you know, I've 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 done previously, which I might be beneficial to to share with others. Is that? But actually, there's two mistakes. Like the first one is that it's actually like a bit funny to me that I'm actually we as a company and I as a person, I'm very passionate about you know cultures and and, and just very interested about them. And I've always believed that that you know it's 
the most valuable thing in any company it, it, it is its people and the culture formed around the people so given that it's it's, it's a bit funny but it actually took my, it took me like probably like almost two years to write down and formalize like what is the supercells culture i mean they had a very clear idea among the kind of six co-founders like of a type of company they wanted to build and what the values were but then it was always like uh, for some reason like too busy or had like more important stuff to do to actually formalize it and write them down and that was a huge mistake and 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 you know like i actually did that then they were already like more than 40 people and it was quite a bit of work at that time sort of starting from scratch and really trying to figure out from everybody like like what actually is the culture about uh, so i would highly highly recommend everybody who's like starting their company right now when it's still like less than 10 people you know you know spend that time you know make that effort and and, and do try to you know write down like the, the culture and and and, and, and values and, and the related point and the other mistake that I've done is that at some point we felt at Supercell that uh, that the kind of the, the culture document that they had was sort of too complicated and it had too much stuff in it in, and people couldn't really remember like all the, all the things in the document. And then they like made a big mistake, which was to like, they started to like kind of oversimplify what that document was about. And they would like uh, replace like uh, longer sentences and and paragraphs be like short caps phrases uh, uh, in, in order for them to be more memorable. And you know, just like, you know, they want to have a great sound bites and stuff. And that was a massive mistake because I mean, let's face it, like culture, it's a, it's a complex thing, I feel in, in, in some aspects. And, and as I said, it's not really about the words, it's about the actions. And if you truly want to explain what the culture is about, you have to like describe the actions but you know, like uh, are kind of showcases of the culture, and, and you sort of have to almost like tell stories, but but show the culture in action, and that just takes time. And uh, and you know now we've actually moved to the completely other extreme, where we don't even have a deck, a, a slide deck. We have a a good old-fashioned like word document with mu multiple, multiple, multiple pages. Um, and 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 what they're doing right now is they're going to attach like even more stories like from the past which we feel like represent the culture which will hopefully you know it will make easier for especially new people to understand what the culture is is about so i i, I guess in short like i would recommend everybody to invest just a lot of time and effort in in that well and I, from my startup founding uh, perspective i can also agree that in my story as well there was the time before we drafted the values and the, there's a time and era after that and there was a big difference <laughs> between those two but yeah so let's talk a little bit more about people and hiring new people so this as well is a critical topic because new people obviously are an amazing way to bring in new perspective but also a way to mess things up for example, the company culture. So could you please share some of your perspectives on hiring and how to make sure it positively evolves the company culture? Well, uh, first of all, I think hiring, you know, by the way, is something where you actually need to have a, a process. I mean, process can be a really, really, really good thing for, for recruiting. Uh, and I, I think the key point is that you want to be very systematic about your recruiting. And, and of course, you need to improve how you do recruiting all the time. I mean, always try to improve the process that you have in place. Um, and, and, you know, at, at Supercell, like, I mean, we are quite a special company because we are in a very special business. Like we are in the games business uh, and um, we, we are lucky um, in that, that in our business, like the quality of the output, it does not necessarily depend on the number of people that we have. In fact, it can be even be the opposite. Look, like sometimes like smallest teams can can just do like amazing creative work, and that's where you know, innovation comes from. So, so in our case, and, and again, we might be quite unique, uh, but but in our case, what has worked is that we've actually hired like really slowly, and and well, we do this for two reasons. Like the first one is that to be honest, it's it's hard to find people who are sort of a, a the type of people that are great fits to our culture which is like very un entrepreneurial i mean many of the super salience like they 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 are 
I, I would always say like all of the super sailors have very entrepreneurial mindset mm -hmm. and, and you know some of them have been founders of, of, of their own companies before they have joined us and those type of people tend to do really well at Supercell and it's just fi hard to find like those type of people. Uh, and then the other reason why we hire slowly is that it's more pragmatic and, and practical. You know, it's easier to keep the culture intact when you have a smaller people, smaller number of people to onboard per, per month. And, and, you know, like, and it's interesting. I think the one thing that I've at least learned during these years is that, you know, uh, it, it really isn't about so much about the absolute number of people. So I, I think it, it's less important like whether you're like 100 or say 300, but what, what, what I, the metric that I really follow and we follow a lot is that the number of new people that we onboard every month uh, and, 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 and we, we even take it to the details, like how many new people we onboard per office how many new people we onboard per team. And, and there seems to be this kind of magical number that you don't want to go over it uh, because uh, if, if too many, if you start to hire at too fast pace, then you can't all of a sudden like integrate these new people to, to, to your company culture any, anymore. And then you, you start to have these like subcultures within the company, which can be a very dangerous thing. And, and again, like what that number is, it, 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 I'm sure it depends on the team and, and the type of company you have. But I, I would sort of figure out what is that number of people that I can hire uh, and, and I can still keep, you know, like, like my culture intact. Mm, yeah. Well, wow, that, is, that is such an interesting <laughs> sort of metric to follow. How many? <laughs> and the pace of hiring <laughs> per unit. Very interesting. So I think uh, we've reached the point where we're going to take some uh, questions from the audience. So please keep asking them. So um, I have the first one here. So here we go. So um, Ilka, you are known to be the least powerful CEO in the world by giving massive autonomy for small cells or teams. This is powerful, especially when operations are going well, business is blooming, and people are uh, feeling happy. But what about when things get tough? Does it change the way you interact with the team? Uh, and um, do you need to be more present and make interventions? What's going to happen? So that's a great question. And I, I think we talked about it a, a little bit, like in, in connection with the trust. So as I said, you know, it, it's easy to say that I, that, you know, trust is important and, and we trust all the teams and, and, and people when things are going well. But if they aren't going well, you know, uh, then like that's the true test of like how much do you actually trust them? Yeah. And uh, the way I, I, I try to approach these type of situations is that I first try to uh, figure out like, is there something like, is there an external factor? Uh, you know, some kind of thing, thing that sort of is uh, hindering the chances of success for, for that team. You know, my favorite question to ask from all of our teams and, and people is that, you know, what, is there something that is slowing you down? Because that's, I think, I feel that that's one of the most important questions in any organization. Because once you figure out like, like what actually is the bottleneck, like what is actually slowing these teams down, I mean, then actually you can do, do something about it. And I actually feel that one of my most important jobs at Supercell is to figure out like what is, what, what is the friction that we have in the organization and, and what can I do to kind of fix that and, and so that these teams can actually make the biggest possible impact without anything slowing them down. Mm. Then uh, the other thing that I try to figure out in these type of situations is that, you know, does this team, do they have a, a right amount of resources or people? Uh, you mm -hmm. know, do they have the right people? Is the, you know, do they have all the skills, skill sets that are required um, to perform well and, and sort of to be the best possible team? Uh, and, and then I, I think ultimately I do ask myself the question that, okay, do I trust this team? Uh, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, our approach is that, I mean, if there's something wrong, we are not going to go and, and tell the team what to do. I mean, if it really does come down to it, then we will have to make some changes to the team composition or, or change the team. Mm. Exactly. Thanks for the, thanks for the asking. Uh, uh, okay, yeah. Sorry? All right, so next question from the audience. So Ben Horowitz had a question in his book. 
Are you actively running towards the pain? How, this is, how is this visible in your work when building Supercell forward? Uh, that's a fa another fantastic question. Um, something that I think about a lot. Um, well, first of all, like if you think about how competitive the world is today and, and you know how much competition there is like from, from everywhere. I mean, we, we are living in a global world these days and especially us who work in any kind of a tech startups, you know, uh, uh, that's especially true about us. But I think it's going to be increasingly true about, you know, um, every business in, in, in the world. Mm. Uh, so the thing is that in, in this type of like uh, very tough global competition, you know, if you start to be like too happy with like where things are and, mm. and, and you sort of continue to do the things the way you've always done them, you know, I, I feel that you're going to be, I mean, you're going to be dead in the water like relatively soon. It, it's, not, it's not a question of, of, of uh, if, it's a question of when. Mm. Uh, so I think it's really important to always try to be better, you know, improve every single day how you do things. Uh, and, and also like try out different things. Don't always do things as, as they've done uh, before and, and really like push yourself and, and, and push others to kind of the uncomfort zone, uh, so, so to speak. And I, I think it, you know, here it, it's really important that you have a type of team and type of people who, who, who actually can do that. And, you know, and it, of course it starts from like pushing yourself uh, but then, you know, and, and, and if you do that, then others around you will notice it. But then also, like, as important, you, you need to push others and, you know, mm -hmm. sort of like raise the bar, constantly raise the bar for yourself and, and everybody uh, around you. And, and always try to, like, uh, as I said, you know, like, do things differently. And then, of course, you know, what that means is, is that, you know, you're going to make a lot of mistakes, but that's, that's fine. It, it's better to kind of push the boundaries. And, and, and make mistakes and not to push the uh, not to push the boundaries and, and always succeed and I, I actually feel that one of the other metric that I follow closely or at least a mental metric that I have is that you know how many how many times this year have we tried something new and, and have failed mm -hmm. and, and you know like and, and I actually I want that number of failures to be like it has to be like somewhat high because <laughs> if, if, it, if it's zero if there's like no failures, in any given year what it, what it tells me is that we, we aren't pushing the boundaries we are not trying to do like a hard enough thing and and, and I know that at some point if, if, if we don't do that it's it's not gonna end well well that's a, that's a great great takeaway for all, all of us and uh, to the next audience question so many qu great questions thank you so much everybody so um one from Oscar, uh, how do you make sure that your teams or cells are always motivated and do not start to compete with each other? For example, if one team or cell is all, always more successful than other. Well, first of all, I, I think it, uh, you know, there are no, no magic tricks that I or anyone else can do. I mean, it all starts, we go back to the hiring, the recruitment. I mean, you have to hire the right type of people with the right type of uh, mindset that's it. and then you out of these people you put the you know we uh, put together the best possible teams mm -hmm. um, and then I, I think you also the, the sort of the culture or the environment must must be one there it sort of rewards you know great effort and great execution and it doesn't depend and it, it re rewards that mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, no matter what the results are at least in our business you know I can I mean many of the games that have like quote failed or we've killed them I mean there's been like fantastic teams behind them like fantastic execution but but unfortunately it just didn't work but that didn't doesn't mean that these teams like didn't do great work because they did and and, and uh, I and everybody else like should be proud of that work um, so I, I think you need to create this type of in environment where you know the effort in itself is, is appreciated and it's not like tied to what the outcome uh, of that effort is and you don't want to be like too focused on on outcome uh, uh, rather like focused on on a, on a great effort yeah yeah well, that's that's a great point and to the next question from the audience how do your employees from other countries adapt to your company culture that's a really good question. 
Yeah, so that's that's a really good question. Um, you know, I, I actually feel that, you know, I mean, Supercell, obviously we are a Finnish culture. Our roots are very deep in, I, I feel, in, 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 the, in Finland, of course, and in, in the Finnish culture. But, you know, despite that, you know, from very early on, uh, a very large part of our recruitment has come from abroad. And, you know, I, I believe that uh, today in Helsinki, we, we have people from way more than 30 different countries. And I think, uh, I, th- I think last year when I looked at the statistics, I, I think like more than half of our game development hires came from somewhere else than, than Finland. Uh, but I, I don't see a, a, a difference between how, say, somebody who's been born and raised in Finland and somebody who comes from elsewhere uh, sort of adapts or integrates to the, to the culture. You know, I, we've, uh, we've been successful and we've had successes and failures, of course, uh, in, in, in both cases. So I, I don't think sort of the kind of a nationality like necessarily uh, matters, at least in, in our cases, it, it doesn't. And, you know, we, we hire against values and culture in, in every case, like no matter where you come from. And, and, and you know, in, in fact, it is like a, really important to both me and, and to everybody, I believe at Supercell is that we have this very kind of multicultural uh, environment uh, in every single one of our offices. Yeah. Wow. Well, that's great to hear. So uh, next question from the audience. So um, what does culture fit mean for you? And is it even a word you want to use? And how do you make sure hiring people that fit your culture uh, doesn't lead to monoculture. <laughs> right. So I think it's a very critical question. So so for us, like when we talk about culture fit, it doesn't mean that we would hire only like uh, say similar people, but we have some like fundamental values that we expect people to have. And mm-hmm. and you know. For example, we expect people to be proactive and entrepreneurial, mm-hmm. and 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 you just have to be like that for you to do well at Supercell. Because because if you because you know at Supercell, you know uh, the you, you won't have a manager who's going to tell you what to do like every single day, or there's not going to be anyone like looking like uh, behind your shoulder to make mm-hmm. sure that you complete your tasks. Uh, I mean, rather like we want to hire people who just you know. Uh, after some time they know like what's the best thing to do without anybody telling them to, to, to do so and of course you can always ask help from others and etc but if you're the type of person that, that that you are not proactive you're not entrepreneurial the fact is that you just won't do well at the company so for so so uh, so what that means is that we, we try to like always that's one of those like key qualities or, or values what that we hire against but again it doesn't mean but that they would hire like all you know similar type of people with similar you know cultural backgrounds or etc etc cetera, et cetera. Mm. yeah well that's that's very good to hear and interesting to hear and the next question from the audience um what was the biggest failure you experienced while building supercell <laughs> uh, good hey, good question i think there's been like so many <laughs> so many failures it's, it's hard to hard to sort of pick just just one maybe because we are talking about culture maybe i just so, should just again emphasize that, that just a personal failure which would have uh, which made my and everybody else's life harder was the fact that we didn't we for some reason didn't write down the culture and values early on i mean had they done done that i would have said like probably like tens, if not hundreds of hours of work from myself and, and, and many hours. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> wow. Well, so um, up to the next question. Um, what tips do you have to build a team culture in times where remote work becomes more and more prevalent and physical contact is restricted? That's a really good one and very, <laughs> very timely. It is very timely and obviously something that we've thought about a lot. Like, um, like basically, like obviously, like we as, as as many other companies, we have shifted almost entirely to to remote work um, these days. And I think we've noticed it was what we've noticed is that you know great teams like somehow 
they find their way like also during these difficult times uh but then like the teams which have like issues mm. uh you know they will have even bigger issues in in, in these difficult times so somehow like the the, the kind of remote work can uh, uh, even make those issues bigger uh, but if you have a very solid foundation like somehow like magically these teams just find their what like, mm. their base but then of course like on a more like practical stand but i i feel that you know when you are not you know bumping into people at the office at the coffee machine etc it's really important to like uh, find ways to make the communication flow and, and you have to like force some kind of mechanisms to make sure that people are on the same page and actually talk regularly mm-hmm. uh, and, and you actually have to put more effort into that mm-hmm. uh, but then like every team at least at supercell i think they have found their like uh, own ways to, to do that, that thing and again like it's not something that is would somehow like dictate from from a top so to speak at supercell i mean it i mean every one of every, every single one of our teams that have, have found and invented their own ways to do that and then of course like our teams have shared like what has worked and what, what hasn't worked with other teams so that they can keep learning as a company yeah very good good tips for every, every one of us so um uh, one of the last questions uh, what are the downsides of self-organizing teams well i, I think yeah, maybe the, the, one of the biggest the potential downsides which I, I feel we've also experienced is that the teams can like uh, get quite siloed meaning that uh, uh, you know they, they just do their own thing uh, and, and, and and you know like and, and oftentimes that's them being focused on their own work it, it's a great thing and, and you know we really are you know we pride ourselves about like having this type of environment where there aren't like external distractions to the teams But then there are situations where it actually would be very beneficial for that team to communicate to other teams on what they're doing, because maybe they're doing something that actually impacts also others around the team. And if they can fail to recognize that moment and they don't communicate, then it can lead, lead to issues and, and, and problems. I'm sure, you know, uh, we as, as many else have like... A, uh, We've experienced such situations. So I think the siloing uh, is is one one downside. The other is that sometimes it can be you need to work harder to create this feeling of a you know the whole company sort of working together you know mm-hmm. towards a common goal if everybody's sort of working on their own thing. Mm-hmm. And and then of course there's also like this you have to find a balance there like okay uh about like when does the team need to prioritize the team's needs versus the company's needs mm-hmm. and, and 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 those type of like really like sometimes even tough kind of trade-off decisions yeah exactly what kind of uh mechanisms do you have for keeping that you know the company people together when the teams are very strong and independent well i, I think we all share the same dream which i've already mentioned you know we want to create these games that are remembered forever so i think that kind of ties us together as 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 people and, and we also like we we all of us believe in in this type of a culture that we have it and the centerpiece of that that is the small and independent teams mm-hmm. or cells as as we call them but mm-hmm. then you know we, we try to uh or, or just basically facilitate uh, events where we bring all people together so for example You know, we end uh, all the weeks together as a company. We have a thing we call Friday update. You know, we, well, then we were at the office. Everybody in Helsinki would get together to the office and then we would video that to, to all the remote offices that we have uh, or people would watch it from video. Um, so we, we do that. And that's a weekly thing where, you know, teams give updates and, and you know, we have Q&As and stuff like that. Uh, then... Every year we also do, we say, we work uh, for one week, we work all, all, we all work together for one location, wherever that is in the world. And we just, you know, fly everybody to that location. And we have a comp- one week's company offsite, which, which a lot of people like. And of course, it gives an opportunity for, mm-hmm. for everybody to, to kind of meet their colleagues in person and, and that. And for obvious reasons, we, we, we didn't, of course, do that uh, this year. And, and we'll see about next year. Um, and then like, uh, maybe the third thing is that we've tried to like do whatever we can to, you know, uh, 
when it was when it was possible to travel we, we we did try to make it as convenient as possible for people to travel um like just taking care of many like practical things because we just believe that you know spending time together like sort of outside your team with our colleagues is is important yeah well so many important and and great learnings thank you so much Ilka. i think we are uh on top of our time so thank you so much for this conversation i hope everybody has has got a lot, lot many things and learnings to take with them to their startups or or works or lives or whatever it's for any, anybody or everybody so um everybody i still uh remind you to go ahead and google the 10 learnings from 10 years blog post created by ilka uh, and read it through so on my behalf thank you so much for joining us and uh, have a lovely rest of the day. Bye-bye. Thank you, Nelly. Thanks, Slash, for having me. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye.